Pampa, the rescue uh, uh, the 999 or 994 and they have a art competition, a painting competition, drawing competition. Finally she won that. <laughs> it's an interesting lot of gifts. She went to another store called Prima where they are trying to kill the horses. They came from the activities for children. It was nice. They are trying to tell us what all government has done for a few years now. It's an interesting concept. I thought some of you would be there, but none of you get interested in that. what the government is doing. Or we already know aware that nothing happening. Okay, but other, 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 other places. <laughs> so a lot of them are happening, is that every state is happening, it looks like. Every state there's a lot of things happening. It's a nice, a lot of people came and a lot of uh, recreation, a lot of old people came, they gave a you know, small box uh, with some rice and some you know, chicken, one egg and one ash It's nice, I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's, uh, it's been planned. I was there at 9 o'clock, I came home at 4 o'clock. A lot of activities in between, a lot of stalls, a lot of gifts, some stalls that were spitting biscuits. I mean, everywhere you go, there's something, you know. But I don't know how exactly uh, it works, you know, in one day, how much these people can really you know, read and digest and, and appreciate or critique what the government is doing. All ministries are there, almost all ministries. It looks like Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Women, Manita, everything is there, everything is there, which is nice. And at least the moment comes to you, look, this is what they're doing. And you can also give feedback, critique, or you, know, you can talk to the people there. Try to get you know first hand information. But unfortunately just before the election, so people are thinking that it is election propaganda or whatever. But to me it is I think uh, it's, a, it's a every year affair, right? Mm -hmm. These things happen every year. If this time it happened just before the election is over. It looks like every year. I asked people, is it election thing? I said no 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 no, it is uh, it happens every year. They say it's some KSAM or something. There's a title for this uh, cutting or whatever. Every year the government comes and tells you what it is doing. So in that way it's interesting to you know, see these activities at like, the national you know, or an outside or a person who is interested in social policy, social politics in this country. Again, good uh, exposure. So today I think uh, we'll try and do this globalization again. A very important word, mostly abused or overused or confused, whatever you call it. I know you know about globalization. So we're all part of that, directly and indirectly. You know? But how is that helps us? What is this globalization? How do we understand globalization? What are the critiques of globalization? What is the positive aspects of globalization? And how the very understanding of globalization, whatever little or whatever, you know, helps us to understand social policy. What is the connection between globalization and social policy? Part one before the break, maybe one hour, one and a half hour, and then we'll break and then we'll come back and see what is this politics of social policy. When we say politics, it's not just party politics as I said in the beginning. And we'll try and understand what is this politics all about and uh, yeah, what is that we can learn. So these are the two objectives for today. We're trying to merge these two weeks into uh, just three hours, but I hope it will be interesting. If this uh, time permits, you'll also see those uh, videos and then it will again give us some more idea about those videos on migration, labor and all that, right? Yeah, this really again uh, helps us to understand the very uh, notion of the very uh, broad area of uh, social policy that we've been discussing in the last few years. Our friend is coming, so all 14 of you are here. So no problem, I have a stall on Gaza and uh, the US and support to the Palestine issue. Sorry? Uh, 500,000, the 52 people went to uh, Gaza with, uh, with, uh, with uh, a lot of medicines and blankets and all that. What is this? Don't you think this is problem? Why Malaysia should you know, be interested in that? And do you think it is really helps or it activates the issue or really resolution can be achieved because now Putrajaya has some experience, Malaysia has some experience in dealing with conflicts in Philippines. The Madanao, right? Madanao. Mindanao? Huh? Mindanao. Yeah. Mindanao, yeah. Mindanao, whatever. So the Kutrajaya, you know, Kutrajaya actually did a lot of you know, conflict resolution there and it, it achieved some positive result. That means, as Malaysia, you have a lot of expertise on that. Maybe you will be able to facilitate. 
who knows? He's talking to Obama, he's requesting to Obama. What all this? So do you think it is globalization? It is the politics. Politics in the positive sense. Or the politics that helps humanity. He's talking about some, uh, what is it? Uh, the mediators club. No, not the mediators club. As if he's talking about an association which is an international, um, he's talking about an association. It's mediators, I think. Is it mediators or arbitrators? A very new word he's using. Is kind of, you know, behind that uh, association. Was supposed to arbitrate and mediate, you know, between countries like uh, Palestine and Israel or Philippines and uh, Malaysia or, you know, many conflicting countries. Very interesting idea again. I think they discussed in the General uh, uh, general Assembly of uh, BN and all these assemblies, they're talking about that. It's also in the front line newspapers. I'm sure you guys are not uh, updating newspapers, you don't have time, but I think if you're interested in social policy, at least we should know what's happening. So that is the thing. Any idea now? What, what else you want to know from this class, for example? What do you think? Do you think this is interesting? It's huge, I know, you know. It's very difficult to cover in three hours, but I think at least some basics, some ideas that you will learn from this class, I'm sure. Because we're going to discuss what is globalization, what is the arguments about globalization. People are you know, taking sides. Globalization is like, you know, it's everyday, you know, a part of life. You can't, you know, but to talk about it. You can't negate it. You can't just forget about it because it's a reality now. It's like university or gravitational force, whatever, you know, it's, it's a reality now. So, what is your idea about globalization before I show some slides? What do you think? Is it good? Is it bad? How do you define globalization? What is your understanding about globalization? Where does it come from? When is it started? By whom it was started? Can we really reverse this process? What is globalization? In my past, there is a new word. Globalization. 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 What is this global world that we are talking about? Is it internet? The whole world. The whole world is one. Is it because of internet? Or is it because of include ICT technologies, mobiles and iPads and Internet influence. What else? Companies, vehicles, okay, aeroplanes, mobility, cheap, uh, you know, uh, tickets. What else? Movies, right? Movies, malls, sharing of common issues, HIV, also a globalization, right? Huh? Do you think the is because of globalization? Yeah. HIV AIDS, yeah. trafficking, yeah. child labor, prostitution. Yeah. Hmm? Well, the issue is not centered to one country, but it goes across. Across. Yeah. An issue, a particular issue like human trafficking, is not just one country. Right? Is it because of globalization? Why do we really you not know, take this word? Or why do we, you know? Like say everything is because of globalization. If that bad, why, why the hell is wrong? Who invented this? It's not bad. It's, it's not, not bad. bad. There are good like private sector. The moment we say private sector, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the moment we, huh? Globalization is not bad. private sector. No, it's not bad. It's, it's not bad. There are good, good side of There are good side of globalization. What is that? What are the good sides? Sharing of information. Sharing of information. Sharing, Sharing technologies. <coughs> so it's good and bad. You don't need to read the word that. It's good, it's also it's bad. So what, what is the big thing about this? So how can we you know, connect this to the social policy in Malaysia? Why are we interested in globalization? And we are interested in you know, social policies in Malaysia. What is the connection? And we are talking about social policies. Which are the policies are we discussing? That's important, right? When we say social policy, which are the policies basically we are interested in? About the, about the housing, 
about health, about education, hmm? about children, uh, disabled. Yeah, there are so many policies. We are not discussing one of them. We are discussing some policies that are very, very basic, fundamental to human life. You know, especially those uh, uh, poor, powerless, or whatever, marginalized. So, what is this globalization to this social? Is something that is being uh, constructed or designed to be one particular country. It has got an influence from the Okay, for example, uh, how, how is our housing policy has been influenced by this globalization? A lot of money again coming, you know, to Panam. That's what yesterday he announced. Some huge, you know, billions of money for a housing shortage in Penang. This called Prime One, yeah. P R I M A. Yeah, they're all middle income dreams, it seems. I also want to buy a house in there. Otherwise, you know, I'm spending a lot of salary on the, on the housing. It's actually stands for Project Urban Supplementation. One Malaysia Housing Development. Yeah, and Penang, a lot of middle, middle income people have these dreams of having their own house. So, how the housing policy of Penang or Malaysia? Is being influenced by this globalization. Yes. Is there any connection? Yes, because uh, uh, now there is some evidence showing that those you know, high cost condominiums mm. are being occupied by foreigners, mm. not bought by Malaysians. Yeah, by, not bought yeah. by Malaysians, yeah, but it's being bought by Koreans and Japanese uh, who are Singaporeans. Foreigners who are moving in. This is because the housing policy does not restrict restricted, you know, uh, to the uh, that. And those monuments were high price, so it is only Singaporeans and Australians can actually afford to pay. So the the, the, the owners are looking for them. Yeah. So there's a demand and there's a supply. You know? And full of both Ferengi is Australians. You know, because of both yeah. Ferengis, all Australians they have this second home or holiday home or whatever. Whereas Malaysians are sleeping on the road and on the pavements. That's what homelessness. Yeah. There was some PhD study uh, coming up. We think there's no homelessness. But there are people with uh, you know, without their own refugees. They don't have their own. And whereas Australians are having two, you know, houses. Is that globalization? Yes? One of the globalization aspects. Why, why, why? What is the connection? Because they can pay, these guys can offer good. No, no At least some money is coming in. Yeah. Huh? Bhatu is full of life, you know, all the time, you know. Music, all the time, you know, shops are open, the local economy, jobs. If there's no Australian there, there's no scuba diving there. <laughs> Some jobs come in, they're paying. It's after all they're paying to the Malaysian, uh, you know, government. Uh, uh, so it's good. Yeah, it's, some people are not able to sleep, but I mean, that's okay. What to do? Maybe the government should do something for that. Why, why we are funding for the government? So this is a contradiction that you know we have to grapple with, and we are social workers, and we are social policy, you know, specialists. So we want to, you know, make sure that uh, we want to give a reasonably good life for everyone, and we believe that policies can actually achieve that. If there is a good drinking water policy, we can provide water for everyone, good access, cheaper, affordable. We can achieve this, you know, with a with with good policy. That is what our premise, right, in the beginning. Yes, social workers, that's what an Indian social worker coming and teaching here and uh, <coughs> sending back you know, money to parents back in India. This is global. Like this is my situation. Okay. Is it good? Is it very good? I am taking on Malaysian job. If I am not here, there would have been some Malaysian job. Or maybe a Singaporean here, I don't know. Not only the sense of job, but social workers get together and make uh, and, uh, uh, and share ideas, share practices. But we thought, what? This was not happening in 60s and 50s and 40s where we were not talking about globalization, for example. 1928, International Association of School of Social Workers has been formed. People have come all over the world and, you know, came together and formed this association called International Association of Schools of Social Workers, IASSW, 1928. Look at the history. What was globalization there? What kind of problems they must be talking at that time? International Federation of Social Workers, again, 1928. People all over, you know, uh, countries came and they met and it was very difficult you know to, to, to go to a meeting like that it seems visas and travel what kind of planning that must have made you know
bringing all these people together, hotels, accommodation, no emails. What would have been the situation? People still met that time. Even now also they get to meet. Maybe frequently more, you know. In the last eight months, maybe I uh, you know, visited four different you know, conferences. Must have not been possible then. But what and then what is that I achieved? More mobility, more rare tickets, more experience. Is it really helping the you know my teaching or not? Or your students have a lot of access now. Is that globalization? If that is globalization, there are 50 key thinkers on globalization. 50 key thinkers on globalization. What is that they must have written? Huh? What is that they must have written? What is this globalization? Is that difficult? But there are 50, you know, global thinkers have written about globalization. That means there is something. There's something that we should really capture. We should really, you know, understand. Otherwise, we will, we will, I mean, we will not be able to do our work. We will not be able to, you know, help our clients or our work. Because it is there, and it is already written so much. Hmm? What else do we know about globalization? When I say globalization, what is again? I'm coming to the basics. Hmm? Fifty key thinkers. What was their very thing? Huh? Globalization, labor, must have written. Globalization, and trade. Globalization, and women. Globalization, and children. Globalization, and social work. Globalization, and medicine. I'm sure this is, this would have been there. Fifty key thinkers. So what is globalization, and social work? Yeah, you said, you know, social work is being influenced by globalization. Yes, I agree with that. Because now we know a lot of things, what's happening in Palestine. For example, we can collaborate with, uh, with the social workers there. Maybe we know uh, how to work uh, uh, with clients or children or women or disabled in a conflicting situation like that. We can learn from that. Social workers were involved in disasters, tsunami or triple, triple disaster in Japan. What kind of tools they have used? We can learn and apply here. Yes, that is possible. Yeah. Of course. What else? What else we can do? Hmm? Is this globalization? Hmm? India, China fighting the big two giants, trying to influence Russia, North Korea, because everyone wants to be you know facilitate North Korean thing. Sri Lanka, India wants to facilitate the Sri Lankan uh, the LTTA issue. Is that globalization? Looking at from through conflict, why US is interested in everywhere? Uh, they go everywhere. You know. Wherever there is a conflict, they go. Otherwise, they create. I don't, I'm, I'm not trying to politically correct here. I'm trying to provocate you. Is globalization all about fight for resources? You know, that's what people are saying, right? Why China and India going to Africa? Because they want oil. I don't know. What do you think about this? Why US go everywhere? Because they want to? It's about cultural, it's about cultural domination. Cultural domination. Mm -hmm. They are trying to you know, impose their culture and it influences mm -hmm. everything in the world to move the culture. Well, maybe. What and we somehow give uh, side effects. Mm -hmm. So we can't, we can't really think of this globalization. On a Monday morning, it spoils the moon. <laughs> Huh? It's cultural domination. Very interesting. What else? It's fight for the resources. It's uh, what else? Yeah, there are some positive points. Yeah, technology. Yeah, maybe you know. So if you see plus and minus, maybe there's more minus or more plus. What do you think? Hmm? This is what Kofi Annan says. If it has been said that arguing against globalization, yeah, anyway, we are trying to argue or we are trying to understand, is like arguing against the laws of gravity. You know, they have been you know, tested and shown that it works. So it seems like if you are arguing against the globalization, people are not going to buy it. Because there are very few people who are actually you know, arguing against. There is a lobby, of course. There are people who are actually thinking, no, it's not going to work, it's not working. Let's reverse this. It's not good for everyone. It's only few countries that are getting benefited. So let's reverse this. But 
That's what it says. If you are arguing against the globalization, it's very, very difficult. Right? We're already into this. Huh? We're already on Facebook, we're already you know, on email, and we thought of email and Facebook and iPad, we can't imagine our lives. Everything is interconnected now, you know. We can't buy a ticket, we can't even, you know, uh, register for a course. It's that, you know, uh, a bit influenced. We are, we are into the web of, you know, uh, whatever we call it. So if that is the case, what, we just don't argue but just take it as it is and just you know, go ahead with that or we still argue and look at very critically being social workers also, you know. What is happening really? Is it really that bad? How, if, if it is good, how can I you know, make most out of that? To get most out of the globalization, what is that I should know? Maybe that is what you know, countries are doing, some countries are getting benefited it seems. So if the uh, next country is getting benefited, why not Malaysia? Why not social workers using you know the, the, the positive aspects of problems? For that we should know what is this positive aspects and how we can actually play with this. And for that we need a very good in-depth understanding. That's the idea I think. I'm sure after this class you guys will have some you know idea about this how to use this. It is a way. It is a type. This is all I take from internet. If you type globalization, look at images, you will be surprised how many images there are there. Last 30 years, 40 years? When do you think the globalization or the, the word globalization started? Or invented or discovered or whatever? 30 years? I'm sure you heard about this much before, right? Maybe 10, 15 years ago? At least 10 years ago, it may have intermediate and bachelors. I'm sure it's intermediate, yeah. Form 5, 6, whatever. Hmm? This is what Canadian Association of Social Workers came up with uh, a definition of their stand on globalization year 2012 years ago. And you can also see many others, what is their view about globalization. What is that they say? Whereas globalization is recognized as a worldwide phenomenon, we agree with that now, we know what is the worldwide phenomenon and we say, that has fundamentally affected the world's economic and social structures. It's not just economic structures, but also it's affected the social structures. You said cultural domination. You know, it's, some people said it's a threat to the local diversity. You know, you, you have Bukit Jumbal came, the man, the big man, the, the Queen's Bay came, all that small, small, you know, sellers uh, are gone. You know, we have to go to the mall for every time. Tesco came, maybe your Malaysian, uh, uh, this is gone. So it's not only affected the economic, but also social structures. I think this is where we need to be very, very, you know, careful. Because at the end, you know, social policy is all about structures, both social, uh, both social and economic. And whereas the process of globalization is a process, it's happening. We can also reverse the process. It's not just one, you know, uh, one year, one step, but it's a process. A globalization is creating a widening gap between rich and poor. That's what they say. And that's what they, you know, they believe that globalization is happening, it's a process, it is affecting our economic and social structures. Because of that, there is a widening gap between rich and poor. This is something very important for us. Don't you think so? This is where I think our social policy, you know, becomes much more vital and crucial. Because there is a widening gap, we need to work with that. We need to fill that gap through social policies. It's widening gap between rich and poor and, and the third one, whereas the benefits of globalization, whatever it is, comes at the cost of destroying world's resources and environment. Yes, there are some positive aspects, but they're coming at the cost of destroying world's resources and create destructive social and economic conditions for the poor and marginalized. I like this statement. Just because it's not you know, uh, from the social workers, but they, 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 they divide it into three things. One, the macro impacts. It is a process, it is impacting our economic and social structures. What way? It is widening the gap. At the same time, it is also taking a lot of resources. Because of that, it is creating a very destructive social and economic conditions especially for the poor and marginalized.
So in the globalization, it's the poor and disadvantaged are at the state. And social policy is all about that. Now, what is the connection between social policy and globalization? We are interested in poor and disadvantaged, and that is globalization is actually not allowing you to do whatever you want to do. Because it's there, I mean, it's widening the gap, it is destroying the environment, resources. Of course, there are some positive aspects, but when you see the benefits and losses, the losses are higher, especially for poor and marginalized people or communities or countries. There's another view, as we said, globalization is impacting the culture, the society, the politics, the economy, the environment, you know, you can add more. Education, lifestyle, maybe it is even influencing our thinking, what do you think? The way we think now is very different, maybe, because we are so globalized, a lot of information. What's ever happening in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Sarawak Sabah, we just come What's happening in UK, we come to know. What's happening in Africa, we come to know. A lot of information. The way we are thinking has also been influenced. I'm not sure. What do you think? What is that I do, you know, when I come to know that what's happening in Africa, for example? Mostly a lot of conflict and war and, you know, uh, accidents and, uh, you know, life-threatening situations. I don't know why media you know, exaggerates or focuses on that. But, you know, you switch on the TV3, yesterday I was just looking at this, the, the whole TV3 news yesterday was basically looking at the accidents and cameras and how people are destroying those cameras. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and now they're coming up with the new technology. How to, you know, find the, you know, number plates. What's happening? How do we understand that, you know, the news that I get and the reality that I face. So this is what happening. So, my child is not safe, I am not safe, my, my old you know, uh, client is not safe, the disabled person is not safe. So, what is that I do? I am more frustrated maybe. Or I am more aware that this is a situation happening, people are destroying the cameras and they are driving fast, so I have to help my clients maybe in, in more ways than I was doing you know, in the past. Uh, two, two messages that I get. Globalization is the integration of economic activities across borders. We are just, you know, uh, uh, re-emphasizing that across borders. Globalization is an irresistible force. We can't resist anymore. Transforming all aspects of contemporary society, politics, and the economy. One more word. Society, politics, and economy. So I can get this, you know, one of the famous sociologists. I can go on like this. Because a lot of definitions, basically the thrust says globalization is a fact and it affects our social, economic and political structures and there are good and bad you know, aspects of it. And we have to deal with the, uh, the negative aspects and we have to understand the good aspects so that we can have better, we can prepare better. Globalization through investments, globalization through human resources, the mobility we just discussed, globalization through exchange of knowledge, which is as good in a way. Globalization to trade, so it's happening in many ways. This is a very interesting book. I think uh, I think it's there in our library. I've not checked, but I think this is Nicola Eats. Is a she's a famous professor in the UK. Written a lot of books on this. She sees some better aspects of globalization in this book at least. Globalization sh shapes the possibility of realizing an inclusive, democratic, and developmental social policy. What is that? That's why I have taken this reference. She says it is possible in a globalizing era or globalizing, you know, whatever century, whatever you call it, it is possible that we can realize, we can come up with an inclusive, democratic, and developmental social policy. What is that? An inclusive social policy, a social policy which is inclusive, it's easy to understand, right? It is, it includes everyone, it's at the same time, it's democratic and developmental in orientation. It's possible it seems. I don't know how. We need to read this book. And she says that globalization entails multiple contradictory processes, which we are discussing now. I'm trying to understand what are these contradictory processes, basically good and bad. You know? 
contradictory processes and that there is a need for informed debate. We can't just say bad, we can't just say good. We need to be informed. There's a need for informed debate about the continued possibilities for progressive social reforms. Each word again, you know, very interesting. You know, it's not just social reforms, but they're progressive social reform and critical analysis of the nature of those reforms that are taking place. That's what she says. What do you think about this? Maybe I'll show you a little bit more. This is what that is, globalization social policy. 2001, 10 years ago. Now, of course, there are other books. Globalization, export-oriented and employment and social policy, social policy for social welfare for There's so many books, but particularly that book by uh, Nicola Eats. She says, it's very interesting, you know, as I said, it's very difficult, you know, to, 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 to believe this. Globalization shapes the possibility of realizing an inclusive, democratic, and developmental social policy. You need to understand this. Because it's there, maybe it's difficult to reverse the whole process, but you have to deal with this. If you have to deal with this, why can't we you know, deal in such a way that we can use globalization to make our social policy more inclusive, more effective, more democratic, or whatever, more developmental. How can we do this? Is it like teaching you know, Facebook or ICTs for, uh, for our old people? Is that? So yeah, there are some school of communications recently, they've organized, or they, they brought some old people from some villages, they taught them how to be on Facebook and all that. Just to you know, relate with their children, grandchildren, living abroad, which is very interesting. And they can do it very well, actually. Once they learn, it's not very difficult. And their life will be more you know, enriching now, because they're in touch with their grandchildren or you know, sons or daughters. Very interesting. Why not? Why, why, why is that they should not use this technology? Just, you know, a little help, you know, bringing them and, you know, uh, helping them and then, and then uh, making accessible, you know, these resources. I think the government also has some, some, some centers where people can go and access this uh, information. It looks like it's possible. Yeah. Also, there are many other books. There is Global Social Policy. We are not just talking about Malaysian social policy or social policy in the ASEAN, but we are talking about global social policy again. Uh, Nicola Eats. Nicola Eats is a senior lecturer in social policy at the Open University in the UK. The understanding global social policy. Again, you know, Nicola Eats. Just, just read some of her writings, it will be okay. You will be able to get the, 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 the positive side because she believes in that. And she, that is what she is trying to write. But we also see people like Bob, Professor Bob uh, Diacon who writes about globalization, social policy, the threat to the equitable welfare. You remember equity and equi equitable yeah. equality? So he says, yes, it's good, but it's difficult to you know, achieve equitable welfare. You know, equitable, you know, I need a house, you need you know, a better transport. You know? Our social policy should catch both, you know, not just health, not just transportation, but you know, whatever we need, it should, uh, it should be able to you know, provide to us. So his paper in 2000, he talks about online, the United Nations Research Institute of Social Development. You can go on to that site, just type in RISD and Bob Deacon, he's the chair, you can see that. His paper argues that the neoliberal globalization, another word, they're talking about just globalization. What is this neoliberalization? Liberalization, a new liberalization, a new neoliberalization. I'm sure some of you are political science or economics. And as social workers, we need to understand these key terms, otherwise we will get lost. And it's not difficult. What is this neoliberalization? Have you heard about this? No. Liberalization. Not liberalizing trade policy, liberalizing, you know, everything you liberalize. You leave it for the market or you leave it for the, you know, uh, the, the trade. It will be okay. You liberalize everything, privatize everything. So the, he says, we'll, expect, we'll also go we'll discuss what is this neoliberalization in a minute. His paper says that neoliberal uh, globalization, actually maybe neoliberalization is one step, you know, to actually to go to globalization, you know. So neoliberal globalization is presenting a challenge to welfare provisioning in the industrialized countries, not only in developing and poor countries. 
place, but also it's giving a threat in industrialized countries. We, we looked at that, you know, the health policy or the, there are budget cuts, even in health. There are budget cuts in the, in the housing, there are budget cuts for the unemployment allowances, right? So these processes, neoliberal globalization, is also presenting a challenge to industrialized countries when it comes to welfare provision. Even Scandinavian, you know, model is changing. And to the prospects for equitable social development in developing and transition economies. The goal of neoliberal economic globalization is the removal of all barriers to commerce, trade, and privatization of all available resources and services. Imagine in Malaysia, everything is privatized, especially health. There is no more Malaysia clinic anymore. Everything is privatized. Remember we discussed last week the private sector. In at least in Malaysia, we have three different you know, models in the private sector in healthcare. One, you have fully government funded, two fully private, and in middle you have that uh, J, what is that? JPZ. Huh? KPZ, yes. It is government funded but in a private form. You know? So imagine what happens if everything is privatized. And the privatization of all available resources and services. In this scenario, the public life will be at the mercy of the market forces, which is very clear. At the extracted profits, benefits only a few. And yes, there is a profit. KPZ also must be making profits. But if they are putting it back or not is the issue. If you are not, then it is only benefiting a few people. The government. We also discussed TLCs, the government-linked companies. What's happening? It's good that government is privatizing, maybe more efficient. But where are these profits going? Is it only for few, few, few people, or is it actually you know going back to the social welfare or social welfare budgets? So he says this is what happens. Two important people, you know. And there are a lot of literature again, you know, the Global Social Policy Journal comes from says again, you know, freely available. I think the last two recent issues where they're talking about children in Southeast Asia. What's happening for the children when there is this economic crisis? What's happening to their education? What's happening to their uh, uh, their nutrition? And a lot of things. Social policy in challenging times, economic crisis, and welfare systems. Global social policy and governance is another book. So what I'm trying to say is that, yes, there's a lot of literature available. And it's up to us what kind of literature we will select and what is that we will try and you know, do with this literature. This is what neoliberalization that I was talking. It is a contemporary political movement, basically advocating for economic liberalizations. Free trade, open markets. The idea is that once you privatize the nationalized industries, resources, deregulate everything and enhance the role of private sector, it will take care of the you know, needs, it will create the modern society or you know that is the argument that they are putting forward. So when it is neoliberalized, globalizing, then it is much more our lives are much more stable. That's what uh, Prof uh, Bob is saying, you know. What do you think? What do you think? Yeah, almost 50 minutes. What do you think? What is our understanding of globalization now? At least there are two different views, and we can see, you know, uh, strengths and limitations in both arguments. Maybe we'll see a little bit more. What is the implications then? Okay, yes, globalization is real. It's happening. It's a process. It is affecting economic and social and political structures. There is. It's also maybe in some countries rich and poor. The, the divide is increasing. But let us see what are the implications of globalization on day-to-day -day lives. Another book, 2007, University of, Chester, uh, University of Chester Press from UK again. What they are talking about is, there are three broad themes in this book. There are key players, policy makers, politicians, media, market, corporates, key players and processes, consequences and impacts, and response and resistance. This is how they are trying to understand globalization. Who are these key players? That's the entry point to understand globalization. How do we understand social work? What are the entry points for us? When we say social work, I'm doing social work, what are those entry points for us? Huh? 
skills sorry quality skill value skill knowledge values okay what else what are the other entry points for us maybe you know functionality or yeah you can you can you can you can, you can uh, approach uh, many ways whereas this book help uh, trying to help us look this is how we can you know try and understand this uh, globalization who are the key players what are these processes whether it is new liberalization or uh, uh, GATT or whatever what are those consequences and impacts of globalization and what are the responses and resistance the movement you know so through these three maybe you know uh, uh, subjects or um, classification maybe we will be able to understand globalization a little better this is a very interesting uh, uh, project uh, called uh, globalization a bipolar story sorry that there is a space between the should there be a space between story and a it's a bipolar story now bipolar is that two camps you know two poles and and, and now we have seen that uh, very clearly a two phase a group photography exhibition a joint collaborative between Massachusetts Institute of Technology US and the Bangladeshi photographers so they are looking at globalization from two uh, different angles photographers and uh, technologists from US and Bangladesh I couldn't see all the photographs the idea is that how do you visualize and perceive globalization from your own standpoint from your own professional background you know maybe if you are an economist maybe you will appreciate more than you know a social worker I see a lot of social workers are very critical about globalization, these processes, because you know we are not seeing benefits for everyone. You know that is where we are talking about justice and equity and equality issues. So this is a very interesting exercise again to look at this this process. As I said, it is impacting everywhere. Look at this: globalized global income is more than 31 trillion, not just billion, 31 trillion dollars in a year. But at the same time, we're producing a lot of money. 1.2 billion people are poor. Why is this? 1.2 billion people is like almost one sixth of the world population. Now we have six billion or seven billion people, right? Whereas 1.2 billion people are poor. Whereas we are producing 31 million trillion, I don't know, dollars economy. You know, we're producing There's a lot of money in the, in the world. But why is that? 1.2 billion people are poor. Who is making poor? They want to be poor, or is some some processor making them poor? Is it their state or their governments are responsible for them to become poor? What is? How do we understand this? Why people are people who are earning not much more and not you know the other way around? The three billion. Uh, now look at the positive aspect. The three billion people living in 24 developing countries that increase the integration into the world economy. The countries were able to Malaysian economy, for example. You have successfully integrated into the world economy. That's why I think there are a lot of you know uh, economic progress. There are three billion people living in 24 developing countries. Increase their integration in India, China integration into the world economy and enjoyed an average five percent growth rate in their per capita longer lives because now your nutrition or your immunization program is better uh, better access to medical and health facilities whatever so your life expectancy is increased better schooling better manpower whatever so in certain countries are making use of this process at the cost of others so is that good or this is how it is you know, competition, you know, survival of the fittest, you know. It's natural, you know. You only survive when you are strong, you know, when you are fit. Otherwise, you will, you know, die anyway. It's natural. <coughs> so, we will think that way or what is that we do? Again, another, you know, fact. Two billion people living in countries like Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East, the former Soviet Union, have been unable to increase their integration. So, certain countries are able to integrate. What is that making them to integrate? Is it social work or social policy or is it economic policies? Why a particular country like Malaysia is able to integrate and get benefit out of it, whereas a country like Sub Saharan Africa, countries in Sub Saharan Africa or Middle East, a former Soviet Union, 
I have not been able to integrate, increase the integration into the world economy and their economies have contracted, shrinked, poverty has increased and education levels have come down and yeah, basically they are lagging behind in this so called globalized world which is rapidly globalizing. How do we understand this? These are all facts, huh? uh, and I can give you the references where I have taken this. Some people are saying it's okay, fine, but it's also, you know, uh, a threat to local and diversity. An absence of strictly enforced international laws means the TNCs. What is TNC? Huh? Huh? MNCs, multinational companies. What is TNCs? Transnational companies operate in NEDC low economically developed countries in a way that would not be allowed in an MEDC. What is MEDC? Hmm? Development. Yeah, MEDC is middle economic. Yeah, the, they may pollute the environment like. India, right? you, 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 want to, you want to break a ship. A ship belongs to a Switzerland or wherever. If they want to break the ship, it's very old and they want to break and sell, get something out of that. You have to break them, otherwise, you can't really somewhere. So they come to India and they do it in Gujarat. When they do the breaking, a lot of oil, a lot of scrap comes out of that. And, and that Gujarat is getting that offshore, you know, the communities, though they get some jobs, actually, they get a lot of pollution. I'm sure it's happening in Malaysia also, I don't, I don't have an example. That's what I, it means. There are some international laws, but there are these you know, processes which a ship can come and you know, uh, dismantle in an economically poor country. Dumping. China, you know, maybe produces different kinds of goods. It dumps, it seems, China dumping. You just type, you will come to know what it means, dumping. You know, all kinds of things. So it comes in the name of aid or whatever, so, is that globalization? If that is globalization, do we really promote that? So that means it, 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 it affects local environments, it affects local communities, it affects so it creates some jobs. Globalization is viewed by many as a threat to the world cultural diversity. You know, Rosalina was also mentioning that. You know, maybe a westernization or a lot of, you know, uh, cultures that can be promoted. It is feared, it might drown out local economies, traditions and languages and simply recast the whole world in the mold of a capitalist north and west. I have taken it from the BBC website. You can see globalization. It is there on the BBC website. An example of this is that the Hollywood film is far more likely to be successful worldwide than one made in China or Malaysia or whatever. Which is also have thriving film industry. But why are we not able to compete with Hollywood? It just goes everywhere, everywhere the seas, the, the, you know, everywhere they are promoting that. What is the relevance? How is this happening? Whereas the Malaysian film is not even able to, you know, even uh, project in, in India. And India is actually, you know, a lot of Hindi, the Bollywood is coming here. Is that good? It's only one day. Again, labor and globalization, you can see the impacts. I'm now we are trying to understand what are the threats, right? What are the threats or impacts, you know? So the, there's a lot of impact on our poverty, economics, diversity, local economies or local way of living, labor, migration, movement. We can see any aspect of our life, you name it, you can see the impact of problem. That's the point that I'm driving at. Maybe we have not understood, we have not looked into that you know, in detail till now. What is the impact of labor? Look at me. I can teach you. I can earn better. Maybe, maybe after two years I'll go to UK, or I, I don't know, I'll go somewhere. Or maybe I go back to India if there is a better uh, uh, remuneration and facilities for uh, teaching, for example. So that the global you know, community is moving. Harvard teachers are going somewhere, Oxford you know, teachers are going somewhere. So people are trying to get the best talent so that you know they can charge more money, more fees. 
more privatization. Is that good? Of course they pay, so they pay, they extract, you know, they, they have a lot of fees. And the students have to pay, people who can only pay to come to those, you know, uh, universities like Oxford and Cambridge or Harvard or MIT or in, in Malaysian case it is uh, what? It is RIMIT and uh, Nottingham and even many students could not have come to be assigned. Look, our, our numbers are coming down. Is that good? Jobs are leaving. Many of the developed nations outsourcing, moving to developing nations. It's free, cheap, cheap labor. I think Christopher also discussed about this. Dr. Chris is very you know, keen about that. It's slave jobs or you know, dirty jobs, what they call it. The money earned helps those developing nations move forward in the world. Of course, it's good. More jobs, cheaper goods, more profits for the best for research and development. Everybody wins or only few wins in this case. Everybody wins. It looks like. But who is winning most? That's important. Uh, you're also earning 100 rupees. I'm also 100, 100 rupees. It would have been okay. But you are earning about 500 rupees. I'm just earning 50 rupees. You are earning 500 rupees because you are getting that job done here and you only giving me 50 rupees. You are earning 10 times more than me or getting benefited 10 times more than what I am getting. I am doing all the job here. So those are the you know, things that we need to look into this. It looks like everybody is winning a lot of jobs but also you are also taking away a lot of jobs. Cheaper goods, more profits. Countries which are open to external investments are able to develop their economies to generate incomes from exports and raise their standards of living. This is another argument for pro-globalization. Migration, yeah, there's a lot of things again. Melbourne is the world's third largest Greek-speaking city, it seems. I mean, yes. Do we know this? Why the Greek people are coming here? Huh? And you are, there are more people who speak Spanish as their first language than there are who speak in English. And you are. Why are the most Spanish people there? What are they doing? Are they doing uh, jobs, I mean small jobs, menial jobs? Or what are they doing there? Why this concentration, Spanish speaking concentration in New York or Greek speaking concentration in Australia? What are they doing? How could they move? Why are they moving there? What are the implications on, on, on families of their own and the others? There was uh, why why this uh, uh, debate on uh, in, uh, Indonesian maids in, uh, in Malaysia? Uh, Indonesian maids or in Bangladesh? Okay, now let's talk. You know, maids from in, in Indonesia they're asking all kind of things. Let's bring maids from Bangladesh. And some people are saying we can do our job. We don't need maids anymore. Stop that. I also have seen some some house you know uh, women or you know some. Uh, how do we understand this? If you stop maybe a Bangladesh woman who is supposed to earn a little bit money, she will lose that. But is it good? Or she comes here and leaves her family, whatever little bit earns, she is not able to send back. Even she sends back, that money is not being spent on productive, you know. They are spending on all kinds of things. And she has been abused here for some time. This is a reality. Though I don't have evidence here, but I read this in the newspapers. What do you think? So it's very critical and very sensitive when it comes to, you know, to our own cases. But this is the reality we need to understand this. Culture, you can see there are a lot of impacts on even culture. Young people, for example, international brands, you know, they only you know use brands, you know, what happens then? Styles without discrimination, they dress up like their favorite brands, words, songs, you know. Our culture is under siege, some people are saying this. Maybe maybe true. Rights, women rights, children rights, disability rights, maybe it's good. Maybe you know now there are more uh, facilities or more uh, tools, more technologies available to argue for your rights, to ensure your rights, share your you know, oppression or share your uh, uh, grief or demands. Recently we have seen the collapse of undemocratic regimes because there are other ways, YouTube and many, many you know, technologies that are helping achieve you know consumer awareness and advocacy so this is good but at the same time look at this 
So what are we concluding here? Basically, there are these two camps. The good, the bad, the positive. There are limitations. There are social and economic costs, but at the same time, there are social and economic gains also. Economies of countries that engage well, they are getting benefited. You know? So that is what uh, we, can, we can conclude from the literature that what we have seen till now. While this will bring benefits in the long term, there will be dislocation costs, there will be you know, many other in, uh, immediate term and social costs for those affected and you can see that. You can see, you know, for yourself, I am just uh, kind of conclude here. Countries which have had faster economic growth have been able to improve living standards. Whereas some countries have been unable to take their own as a globalization because they are already poor or the, the standards of living are dropping further behind the richest countries. The gap is 20%. So these are the realities when it comes to this. So globalization is not just only reducing the resources available for social services and reshaping organizations, but it also creating new patterns of work, mobility, migration, new patterns of thinking, technologies, accountability, profoundly reshaping our fundamental values and philosophy upon which the modern social policy world has been built. So it's you and me have to think critically and understand and make use of globalization and the advantages that comes with the globalization to really help our clients who, whom we want to cover or whom, whom we want to help through this social policy. That is what it says. And accountability and profoundly reshaping our fundamental values, our philosophy upon which the modern social policy world has been built. So that is the connection that, that, that we can see. Much of the general public discussion in globalization is not very on the basis of clear assumption. There's a lot of biasness, there's a lot of ideologies, there's a lot of you know uh, things that are influencing our understanding. However, when an industry globalizes, oh, this is important. So when the, the confusion here is that the starting point for understanding this much discussed and overused concept of globalization is that. In strategy terms, it is industries and markets that globalize the non countries. When we say this, they are making a distinction between the, the globalization process and the forces behind the globalization. It is the markets and the industry that globalize non countries. When we say that, when, the, when an industry globalizes, 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 it undergoes structural shifts, it is multinational or transnational, whatever. It, it, it will go with these structural shifts so that the organizations within, within it find that their position in one country is significantly affected by their position in another country, Coca Cola, for example. Recently, you know, the, 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 there's a Coca Cola plant which was in Canada being closed because of the local movement there. They're taking, you know, they're taking, there's a Chalakuti River, they, 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 they duck, you know, very uh, powerful bore wells which can. Suck the water and the, and the farmers, you know, wells have been gone dry because Coca Cola is taking all the pumping, they're onto the port, they use a lot of, and it has to be closed. It's also possible. So it is the companies, it is the market we need to understand, which is a global force now, and able to uh, learn to deal with them, learn to you know work with them, learn to get. This is where I think again the CSR or the public private partnership. There's many other models that are available for us now. So the impact of global industries on global organizations, on countries in which they operate, inevitably create stronger interconnectedness economically with potential social and political consequences. So if you are a social policy, social worker, I don't work with industries, I don't care what is market. No, we can't say that. We need to work with, we need to understand, and we need to make use of this processes for the rights of our clients or for the benefit of uh, the people that we are working with. This means that as a result of this globalization of industries, greater linkages, interaction, interdependence build up between nations. Yes, and we need to exploit that. And finally, this is what globalization. You can see it is in the food, it is in the technology, it is in clothes, it is in the environment, conservation. You name anything, it is there. Any questions? Uh, what is that we have seen? And how can we connect uh, this?
refugee issue to globalization and also the politics of you know, the social welfare. Can you see that? Who is a refugee? I mean, why, why is this issue called refugees? Why people become you know, refugees or illegal migrants or migrants without papers, whatever you call it, it's the same person. They have no passport. They don't have passports. <coughs> They know, I'm sure, when they are trying to come here, that uh, the UN and Malaysia is not a UN convention or UN signatory, so they can't really, you know, get whatever they think or the, whatever they visualize back home. So it's like uh, jumping one fire to another fire, you know, or one uh, yeah, difficult to another difficult. Why are they not going back now? My mother, I think things are improving now. Why is that they are not going back? They don't have to compens anymore. Yes, You 
see the globalization here. Well, Rafi is the issue. Do you think it will ever resolve? In a particular time in the, in the, in the history that there is no refugees anymore. No borders, no passports. Or all countries are rich, safe, peaceful, prosperous, so that you know a particular country, uh, citizens you know, need not to flee or you know, flew away to another country. And uh, often you know, at the, the risk of their lives. People risk their lives when they cross borders, spend all their money. They, uh, they know that you know their life is the other side is not safe. They know that. Still they do that. You know, we have a lot of Bhutanese, TPTM refugees in, in Malay, in Nepal. Nepal is also not a uh, refugee convention country. But some of the refugees are much better than local Nepalese. Because they do a lot of industry, jobs, carpets. You know, there's a lot of, it's a different network. So it's up to the host country what kind of treatment they want to give to these so-called refugees or illegal immigrants or migrants without papers, documents, without passports, whatever you call it, it's the same human being we are talking about. And is that globalization or something related to globalization, this issue? Why, why people want to migrate to US? Why people want to migrate to Australia and uh, New Zealand? Though it's also very difficult there. Huh? To Malaysia. Why, why is that they are not migrating to Vietnam? In Vietnam also, I am sure there are some refugees, I am not sure. They migrate to Pakistan, but not to... Why, why, do they migrate to Thailand? Yes. Thailand also receives a lot of uh, Burmese uh, refugees. They are looking for job opportunities. They are looking for job opportunities. Which country is close by? Geographically, which country is close by? So from Myanmar, Malaysia is close by? Yeah, there are some routes, maybe a sea route, yeah, yeah. whatever. But there must be some attraction, you know, when they thought of Malaysia. Right? I saw refugees in the US, for example, from Africa to US, from India to US, from Nepal to US. Why they want to, you know? They come, they go, I mean, some of them, they just go to the country, like they're all working, bureaucrats or, you know, NGO workers, go to the country, remove, you know, throw the passport, willing to become a refugee. I can become a refugee here in this country if I want. Just throw the passport and just, you know, go there. They, there are people who does that. That's why even when you go to a conference or everything, they, they have all these, you know, things. Otherwise, why they should worry about that? I'm not applying for asylum seeking. I'm going to a conference, I have a lot of funds, but still they want to scan. Why? Because I go there and willingly become a refugee maybe. Maybe I have a lot of, you know, political, you know, whatever threats, I can also do that. That's a different kind of refugee as I would say. A critical refuse. You know? A lot of Nepalese went abroad seeking you know, critical refuse because the situation back in Nepal is bad. That's what they claim. Maybe some are true, but many of them it seems have used country situation to become refugees in other countries. There's a lot of evidence on that also. So refugee thing is a lot of complex issue again. And do you think any connection with globalization that we've discussed? Maybe some countries they just look for refugees, they willingly take refugees and give all kind of you know uh, opportunities to work, which is cheaper. Like in Thailand, you see that. A lot of it seems construction workers are actually comes from from the Burmese or whatever. And they allow that, you know, because it's cheap, they, they, they don't have any rights, they, they, they don't ask for rights, they don't claim for their rights, it's cheap, it's cheap labor basically. Much cheaper labor. So this is also economic, political, you know, economy. The way you look at, you know, these refugees as a, you know, source of labor. Do you think the countries does that, or you don't believe in that? There must be some policy behind a particular country is doing X, Y, Z, you know, when it comes to refugees in asylum seeking, for example. Why people, you know, don't ask for refuse in, uh, in Middle East countries, for example? Huh? They are also rich. Is it the law or the way they treat the refugees? What is that, you know, uh, stops? Uh, what is that in a particular country, you know, to attract a lot of refugees? Is it economy? Is it the law, past history, the economy, the sea routes or whatever? So many things, I guess. And this is anything globalization. We can see very, very clear connection with the, the very politics and knowledge of the particular country. But what about globalization? Just go back a little bit. And then we'll start this. 
to me, is the two sides. You know? Politics, you can't, you know, uh, or to, you know, take it. You know, it's there every country, whether it's a failed state, or a welfare state, or a rich state, or a capitalistic state, any state. You see there are some governments, some politics, some form of, you know, uh, governing the system, right? And you see, uh, whether it is Cuba or whether it is uh, uh, China, there is some form of globalization also we will see now. So this refugee issue, how do you understand? If you want to really work with this issue, what is that we look into? Why the UNCHR is not able to convince Malaysian government? Maybe they are trying, I'm sure they are trying. I don't know how many years they are there. For International Office of Migration, IOM, is another UN organization which works with these migrants, which has actually did a good work in Nepal. They are all facilitating this Tibetan Putin in refugees, a third party settlement, US and many other countries, they are settling them after 20 years of whatever conflict. What do you think about these UN international organizations role in, in, in <coughs> dealing with issues like this? Context, 
What is Shelly? Look at the context. Alice. Huh? Links. What are the links? And then the E is external, you know, uh, whatever. No? Such, such in frameworks, I think, will help us. So I like this. If you like, you can also apply this. Now, what do we understand otherwise? We will get lost. Now, we have to start somewhere. The refugee is very interesting. I think there are a lot of career opportunities, even if you look at a career point of view. Otherwise, it's going to be a big issue when it comes to social policy. And you can also look at the regional and ASEAN. What is the ASEAN policy when it comes to migrants and refugees, illegal migrants and refugees, for example? To get into the regional things, and then maybe you can also connect yourself to the global players, global social policy. That's what I mean. So maybe we can uh, move on now. Uh, uh, until unless, or otherwise, you want to say something more about this. What is happening here? Can you say one word? One, one, your own idea about globalization or politics of globalization uh, and the social policy. What is happening? What is what, what are you thinking in your mind? Even human trafficking, much more difficult. Refugees, you can still you know see the issue, right? But what about human trafficking? Very secretive, very sensitive, a uh, lot of mafia involved. How do you then uh, address that? What drugs? <coughs> There is a relationship between globalization and drugs. Drug, you know, the availability of drugs, access to drugs, drug selling, drug usage, NGOs working, government, you know, uh, vigilance. What is this? Test? You know, it's also a golden corridor, whatever. Drugs, you know, a small arms. I think all these issues are somehow, you know, uh, connected to this, this global process. Where do we start? How do we start? Maybe this is one good thing. The key players and processes. Very, I think these are six key words that book you know talks about. Who are those key players? And what are the processes? And the second level, who are the what are the consequences and impacts of the drugs or human trafficking in the originating country and receiving country or whatever countries that we are talking about? And what is the resistance and response? from the community, from the government, from the other departments, from the whatever. So if you put together these three pieces together, I think we will be able to understand the very impact of the globalization and we can see the, the connection to the politics there. So uh, part two, so, uh, what is this? Says? Policy about? Yeah. Public, uh, policy. public policy. Written by, I think, uh, Hussein, this is maybe a Malaysian writer. Ahmad Atwari Hussain. Huh? I could not get where it is published, but it is there. So let's see the now the other side of the uh, social policy discussion, where, which is very important to politics. Politics finds its sources not only in power, though you said power, politics all about power, not only in power, but also in uncertainty. That's very interesting. Uncertainty. Uncertainty in your own country, you know, you flew away, you fly, you know, to Malaysia. And again, uncertainty in life, you, you know, gone to Chandil. Politics finds its sources not only in power, but also in uncertainty. Last night I was seeing a Tamil film, so all talks about fear. You know, this, this, you know, this, this fellow who became a, a small child in a tea shop becomes a town or mafia king because he understands how the fear, the psychology of fear, fear works and he manages on that, he works on that and, uh, and, and becomes a lot of money and becomes a uh, minister or whatever, the hero also works on the same concept, concept for fear. Politics finds its sources not only in power but also in uncertainty. Men collectively want, uh, wondering what to do, governments not only power they also puzzle policy making <coughs> in the form of collective puzzlement on society's behalf. That's what you know. Hackler, I don't know if I exactly where it comes from, but uh, you, can, you can Google and find out where is this. But the last sentence I really like it. Policy making is a form of collective puzzlement. It is a puzzle. Uh, after 57 years or 53 years of 
Malaysian independence, it's still a puzzle. People are talking about different things, new things, new promises, new policies. It's a puzzle. Policy making is a form of collective puzzlement on society's behalf. We are making these policies on behalf of refugees, on behalf of children, on behalf of women, on behalf of disabled, disabled people. So politics finds its sources not only in power but also in uncertainties. So that you know, you are uncertain about your own life course, you are uncertain about your own income, you are uncertain about your own employment and that's where maybe you are loyal or you are subscribed to a particular policy of a particular government. So men collectively wondering what to do, men, women, whatever. At the same time governments not only have power, they are also puzzled. You know, puzzled people, communities. And this is where, because politics and power and governments are like that, Policy making is become a puzzle, or a collective puzzle, which we all try to put, you know, pieces together on on society's behalf, on, on people's behalf, on communities, you know, behalf of the communities, behalf of the children. So this is, I mean, what do you think about this? This day? do you think social policy is a puzzle, and politics is all about power and uncertainty? Or it's decided, it's clear. It's taking advantage of the uncertainty. It's taking, yeah, politics is all about taking the advantages of the uncertainty. Yes, look at the refugees case. Or look at many other, you know, maybe uh, racist communities or, you know, some uh, minorities. This is where, you know, I think uh, uh, some party politics or uh, whatever politics that we see. Politics finds its sources not only in power, but also, see this is just one definition I'm trying to you know, use to trigger our, our thinking. Maybe we could have used something else. But I like this because policy making is a form of collective puzzle which we are trying to understand. Is this really a collective puzzle? What, what is a puzzle? A jigsaw puzzle or whatever. You remove one block, it changes. It put, it may suit, it may not suit. You know, so you can change the form, shape, color. Sometimes it matches, sometimes it will not match. Uh, sometimes you are really creative to, 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 you know, to do that puzzle uh, in the way it should be done, given given the time. So politics, social policy, globalization. How do we understand these key words, and how do we see these connections? If social policy or policy making is a puzzle, uh, how do we then make this puzzle which works for everyone? Especially children, women, you know, uh, disability, or you know, people that we work with. That's okay. The, that's the art of puzzle making. That's the art of puzzle, you know, solving whatever. We'll see some more slides and see what 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 we are, what we mean by politics or politics of social welfare. The politics of social policy in the United States. You can see a lot of literature again, like globalization. A lot of literature is already available. The politics of social policy in Europe. The politics of social policy change in Chile and Uruguay. Look at that. Maybe I'm sure Malaysia have not came across. Maybe you, one of you, can write this. I'm sure. What is happening in the last 53 or 57 years here? A lot of literature already. Know. What is that literature saying? Basically, they're talking about the basics again, the theories of welfare. You know, a particular government subscribes to a particular type of welfare. What is this welfare that we have discussed? I have shown this slide recently also. This is difficult, you know. But that's where the core is. What kind of state, what kind of welfare that you are trying to create or trying to craft or trying to build in a particular country. And once you do this, you are invariably, you know, going back to the, 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 your, your manifesto, your policy, your politics, whatever. What kind of state? Uh, Malaysian state that we are, we are now, you know, the, the opposition party is also saying welfare. The, 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 the party in power is also saying welfare, but they are talking about two different types of welfare. Can you say something on that? What is Nazi saying now? They are also talking welfare state, but I showed you, I showed you the slide. I think he is repeating the same stand even recently also. Yeah. Welfare state, but not a fully a welfare oriented. Yeah. The other guys, they are also talking about welfare, but more on spirituality and environment and resources and all that. So the moment you subscribe to the particular ideology, 
you're, you're, you're getting into you know, uh, this uh, politics or policy process. So theories of welfare, there is this liberalism, Marxism, feminism, maybe we will not discuss in detail, but if you are a liberal country, what kind of welfare state that you will come up with? <coughs> liberal welfare, that's what we have seen in one of the states, the US model. You remember that slide? Liberal welfare, a demo, social democratic. So the moment you subscribe to liberalism or individualism, markets, competition, you are talking about liberal state, a welfare liberalism. You like it or not, you have to grasp these concepts because this is what the science of policy is all about. People will be talking about this. So as social workers, we need to read and understand what is this liberalism which political science you know, students are talking about. In, in few words, it's all about individualism, market and competition. For example, Marxism. I mean, I'm sure you have heard about this. What is Marxism all about? A few key terms. It's about class conflict, central planning, and direction, or maybe you can add more keywords. Fabianism, which we discussed in UK, for example, that is the source of social welfare in 1960s, I think. It's all about cooperation, reluctant collectivism, and acceptance of the market and competition, but also a recognition that state planning should be utilized to move towards a fairer society. To me, Fabianism is a you know a combination of liberalism and Marxism because they are talking about competition but at the same time they are also talking about central planning. So there are these theories or ideas, ideologies which influences your, 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 the kind of state. The moment you, know, you subscribe to one of these ideologies, you are basically you know, you are planning your uh, the, the politics of the country, the way you govern a country you know, depends on this. So I will not go into socialism, critique of socialism and all that but I think this is important if you like you can go into this. Um, okay, maybe we'll discuss this political conflict over social policy, for example. Let's look at uh, the debate on social policy in Malaysia. Who, who is saying what? Or any other policy you can get. What are the? What is the most contentious policy now in Malaysia? Very hot. Huh? Sorry. One Malaysia policy. Okay. What is that people are saying? Or we attend it to the, the education blueprint, the polar education policy. So what are the conflicts? What are the debates on that? I'm sure any policy you know has been debated, right? So what are the debates? Where is this debate coming from? What is their argument when they're debating? For example, the education blueprint that we have attended, some people are saying, most of them are saying it's still the same thing. That it's still fragmented, it's still, you know not able to address the core issues of the education but they are talking about all these 22 you know that's what they said maybe other people are saying something else no this is a blueprint this is good this will address all the issues of you know education in this country can you, can you say something take any policy and tell us or tell me what is the you know uh, debates on that when I say political conflict what I mean by this is people taking you know sides and they, they see policy as a resource and they, 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 they fight over, the, there is a conflict and if you, this is one way to win people for example. This is my policy, look this policy will work and this policy is bad, it is not working, it has been there for 25 years, it is not working. So we will come up with a new thing. So looking at policy as a resource and then try to you know, influence that. Am I making sense? What is political conflict or what is conflict? Okay. What is conflict? Huh? Contradicting ideas. Contradicting ideas. Okay. What else? Huh? What is conflict? We use this word so often. Different beliefs. Different beliefs. Okay. I don't believe you. You know. Or uh, I think my idea is better. Yeah. Or disagreement. What else? What is what else conflict? Huh? In Bahasa, what is this conflict? Conflict. Okay. Over, over space, over, over ideology, over politics, yeah. and, uh, in decision making. Wherever we use this word conflict, there is a conflict between students and teachers. Among students, yeah. conflict among race, conflict among religion, conflict among uh, uh, state borders, conflict over the policy. 
When I said political conflict, basically different parties are you know, talking about the same policy and giving their own views and you know uh, with, with evidence. Look, this is the policy works that is not working because of this, this, this. It has not achieved the results it's supposed to achieve. So basically, conflict is a is a not in the terms of uh, blood or you know or death or you know, it's conflict is basically a ideological conflict or or um, uh, what it could be political conflict. When I said political conflict, it's basically looking at social policy as a resource and you try to influence that. And you have your own opinions, you have your own arguments, you're trying to win, you're, you're, you're trying to win the you know, public with your uh, with your um, with I your mean, ideas, arguments or basis, whatever you have. That's what I mean. And it's happening. It's happening in Malaysia. On each policy you can see that. There is no one policy, even Malaysia one policy is not agreed by you know, all Malaysians. Why? Different ideas, uh, different results. People have seen it differently, you know. They associate with this policy differently. It's natural, you know. So, and these conflicts are inevitable, they are there, they will be there. And we social policy students should be able to understand that. That's what I said, politics of social welfare. You know, once you understand, you'll be able to deal with, like again, the same, well, like, like globalization. You can see that interprets electoral strategies behind political parties and social policies. You, when you vote, you, you just don't vote like that. Even in an uneducated, illiterate, whatever you call it, you have got money from the you know, uh, parties, you have given all, all kind of you know uh, gifts or whatever. Still, I think when you are making a, you are putting a vote, you are still, you know, there is some decision making you know, uh, will, will happen. Interpret electoral strategies behind political parties and their social policies and you, you subscribe to a particular party. You analyze the ideological dimensions of that social policy, which we are just discussing. Analyze and critique the government, the media, uh, depictions of social problems and social policy responses. You could be anything, it could be anything. You understand how social, social policy processes create political insiders. Now, what is this? Okay. What is this insiders and outsiders? You understand how social policy create political insiders and outsiders. How do we do this? You remember we, we did a stakeholder analysis? Who is an insider who is an outsider? Or we can use uh, uh, maybe in other words, uh, uh, what could be other word? Okay, let me say, if, if I say that, for example, housing policy in uh, in, uh, in Penang creates some insiders and outsiders. Who are these outsiders? Who are these insiders? Definitely insiders are the, are the real estate uh, people who are interested in uh, housing construction. Insiders are the people who are willing to buy a house or middle income people. Who are the outsiders? No? Observers. The, the outsiders in the sense uh, people who are, who are not willing to buy that policy or willing to, not willing to you know, agree with that policy. Oh. Each policy creates some winners and losers. Yeah. Insiders and outsiders. Opponents and supporters. Whatever word you use it. So in this case, housing policy, who are the insiders? And who are the outsiders? Or who are the supporters? Who are the you know critics? Exactly. Who are they? Foreigners. Foreigners, because maybe they get cheap uh, housing. Why foreigners? Maybe a middle income group. They can afford to you know buy or they earn. Okay. Who, who else? Who else? The banks, the the, the financial institutions. Maybe they subscribe. Who are these outsiders? Huh? <coughs> groups, they say no, it's already enough. There are so many projects that have already been failed, it's not been occupied, we don't need new. Who else? The brokers? Do you think they're outsiders? They must be inside, they must be happy you know, to, to, to do a more brokering. The government is inside already it's already proposing, you know. Who else? Social workers? Insiders, outsiders? 
Depends. Maybe you're working at the JKM. There is some less. Huh? But what I mean is. It depends on the kind of housing development that is. Exactly. If it is meant for the low income people, then the social workers might fall into the category of insiders. But if it is an exclusive condominium with so many pools and all that. Only for rich, maybe we fall outside. Exactly. So each policy will create insiders, outsiders, supporters, and uh, you know, critiques, uh, all that. That's what I mean. So at the end of the day, we are seeing what this is the policy. Either I support, I don't support. And it's based on my whatever beliefs, right? So when I said political conflicts over social policy, it's the same. You know, you, do, you, you look at a policy and different parties in Malaysia, it's only in a few parties, for example. India is very difficult. There are 60, 70 parties, for example. In the US, maybe still, you know, uh, only two major parties, but still, basically, there are these different groups, coalitions or advocacy networks and media. You can see that. So, each policy wins some insiders and some outsiders, and we need to understand that to understand the conflict or to understand the, the negotiation or contestation, whatever word you use. Basically, you know, we need to understand this. Locate contemporary social policy in the context of long-term welfare state reform. What, what does this mean? We are trying to understand conflicts about policies or over policies. So, okay, let, let me remove the political conflict, for example. Conflict around policies. You are able to see that? No policy is subscribed by you know, all 28 million you know, citizens. It is contested. It's like that. I'm sure even with the order 22 or 14, you have different opinions about each of these policies. Because of your gender, your race, your age, your income status, your own ideas, right? So that is what I mean, conflicts or negotiation, articulation. Whatever word you use, it is there. When you try and understand these conflicts, you are trying to understand the very politics behind that. That's what I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to relax. You understand? What I mean by politics of social policy? No. A little bit. I'm not using politics in the literal sense of party politics. Politics is everything. The race, the economy, insider, outsider, campaigner, social worker, many things here. That's what I mean. Politics of social policy. Let me use another word. Politics of, uh, politics of media. When I say politics of media, what is that? Media politics. Politics of media. What does that mean? Huh? Huh? You used this word, right? What what do you mean by this? Huh? A CNN and uh, Al Jazeera and uh, uh, BBC. What does they do? They create different images. Right? They are not saying the same thing all the time. Maybe only a few times they say What is that? Why are they doing that? If it is one fact is there, if one news is there, why, why are we getting different news? BH and Times and you know, uh, Sun, it also belongs to which group, what is your ideology, which political party you belong to, who is behind you, all that is coming to play, right? Politics. Politics is a lot of actors. So policies or politics of policies also a lot of actors. That is what I am trying to, you know, to, 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 to highlight here. Can you see that now? When I say politics of social policy, who are all coming to that? Say politics of housing policy. The builders, the association representatives, the politicians, the, 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 the land, the landowners, the media, the state, maybe the banks. A lot. So we are going to the day one. When he said the actors, policy is all about a puzzle or actors. So when I say politics of policy, basically I'm referring to that. What happened? Okay. Um, any other questions about this word? When I say politics of policy, what is that? Or when we hear politics of policy, or you know, uh, politics of social welfare, what is that? What does that mean? Huh? It's a lot. We can't explain. Huh? It's a very interesting word. Uh, a lot of politics here, group dynamics. It's everywhere. 
Ça veut dire, une famille est un endroit où les parents jouent, jouent, jouent. You know that uh, your daughter will deal with your mother one way. If she wants, you know, more uh, pocket money, she deals with the father. What is that? It's politics. It's politics between students and teachers. What is that? Maybe I have a different idea, right? And I'm trying to influence you guys on that one. I'm trying, I'm playing politics here. Politics is a place where we contest, where we argue, where we, you know, uh, agree to disagree. Right? Maybe you, we have different ideas, but we can also say that, okay, we have our own ideas, but we can still work together. Social work is all about politics. So when I say uh, politics or policy, this is the last concept I think in our class, very important is, when I say politics or policy, it's not just one actor. We're looking at from all sides, that includes globalization, that includes your private sector, that includes your state. What else we discussed? That includes your state, that includes your uh, NGO, your civil society. So that is what I mean. There is this book by Contentious Politics. Now we are trying to understand three more words. <coughs> what is consensus politics, contentious politics, and confrontation politics? Very important to understand our policy again because these three types of politics you see there. There are so many, but we'll just focus on these three types. Consensus politics. Napa, what's happening is consensus politics. Politics by consensus. A lot of people come together, they have a consensus, and they implement it. Good or bad. We'll go into these details. Confrontational politics. Confrontation. And then, contentious politics. So in a particular country, the kind of politics that you have also influences the kind of social policy that you have. What do you think in Malaysia, what's happening? Is it consensus, just by the word, contentious or confrontational? What kind of politics you see here? Huh? Consensus. All 13 states happy together. No. Contentious. You contest, but still, you know, or confrontation. Gaza and Israel. It's a clear confrontation to each other. How do you understand this? Do you see now more and more types of politics? We're not political science, but we need to understand this. Contentious politics or consensus politics in Spain. A lot of things are written already in this. I thought these three words in this we will be able to understand social policy. And when any social policy will have all this. Any social policy will have politics. The moment we talk about politics, we see this. One Malaysia is a consensus policy or contentious policy. Each policy we can see these three things. Maybe when it comes to youth or unemployment allowance, what kind of politics it would be? All youth, irrespective of race, community, I think will come together and say yes. Okay, we need, you know, youth unemployment allowance, consensus. Okay, what is consensus? Most of the time we do this. Okay, maybe one person cannot do this, they don't, they're not interested in group projects, but still majority, you know, saying that, okay, we go ahead, we will have this individual term papers and also group papers, we go back to the consensus. Consent, informed consent. Consensus, I don't know what is the exact word. Agreement by large. So a broad consensus exists when a great number of people agree on something. For example, from tomorrow onwards, we say that irrespective of the religion, all have, will have to have this. Consensus, why not? Or in, in USM, uh, uh, respect of your, uh, your class, you only pay this much. No, no, there is no difference between fees, between engineering, medicine, humanity, arts, you know. There is one thing. One thing. A large agreement on that. So a broad consensus exists when a great number of people agree on something. But is that possible in a particular country like Malaysia? Is consensus possible? How do we bring consensus? Is it easy? We are social workers. Most of the time, this is what we do. It's very process oriented. How do we bring people to a particular consensus? 
Huh? By disseminating. Okay. By disseminating. Okay. By talking about the, the, the good and bad or the aspects of the particular policy and relating to a particular policy. You want to bring a consensus towards your breastfeeding policy, for example, or your kidney donation you know, or organ donation policy. How do you bring that? You want to use consensus. Then look, 95% of the Malaysians are saying they're interested in you know, human organ donations. Well, that's their policy on this. 95% of people are saying that HIV AIDS needs special treatment, special quota, special whatever provisions. That's how, how do we forge consensus? That's one way to influence the social policy or to do politics with social policy. Consensus politics. Any example on this? The education blueprint, they are trying to do that. They are trying to do that. And they are trying to bring consensus from all races, all you know, uh, actors, all players. It can compute the breadth of consensus by a mere head count. What is that? We can find out the level of consensusness. The breadth and the width. What is that? The breadth and the width. This is a general agreement, but still people you know inside, no. They're not really, you know, if you really ask, they will not give consent. But generally, overall, we have agreed with that. Right? We don't have major issues with that. I'll show you another graph that it will help you to understand you know, what is the breadth and the depth of the consensus. Next, we can find out a consensus can be deep or shallow, or you know, uh, not very deep. Depending on whether initial agreement leads to additional agreements. Depth of consensus is a matter of the commitment of people derived from the agreement on issue. Consensus regarding BN policies, for example. Irrespective of whatever it is, I subscribe to that. You know, they have some people, 10% of whatever. That is their that, that is their depth. You know. For example, ten percent of Malaysians blindly support BN. Whatever is the policy, you know, it's easier. The consensus can be deep or very shallow, very you know, uh, uh, not very deep, depending on whether the initial agreement leads to initial agreements. In the sense, you you believe you agree, the depth of the consensus is a matter of the commitment of the people derived from the agreement on a particular issue. I mean, it's like you know, loyalty, whatever you call it. So, on each policy, you can see this. At least 10 percent, 15 percent, 5 percent. You know, people will will buy this uh, argument or support this policy in respect of their their uh, their positions in a particular community, for example. For example, you have a discussion, then you have a proposal, then you have a test for consensus. Modification to proposal, stand aside, block, action plans. For example, you have discussed, you have a proposal for a particular policy, then there is more some test whether people are going to buy this or not. If it is no, then again concerns are raised and you will stop that policy. For example, when you are trying to test for a you know for a policy, if you think there is some consensus, then you go for Consensus achieved and you go for action points. Very simple. Basically, how do you achieve consensus? How do how a particular policy can actually you know be implemented? What do you think about this? There is a lot of discussion. Okay, I want to bring an education policy. There's a lot of discussion happening, right? Then there is a proposal, there is a blueprint now. Then if at least 10, 15 percent of people are willing, still I go for you know further consensus, no one is, you know, interested, then it is been scrapped, you know, concerns raised and the, 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 the policy is blocked. Maybe again you can go for discussion again to try to bring the consensus. Can you give me one example of this? In a particular time, people have not agreed to that particular policy, but later they have agreed. It's possible. Anything that you can think of that? Consensus has been changed or been built over time. Huh? Baby hatch. Baby hatch. Baby hatch. Maybe initially there was, uh, you're right, 
Initially, there was a lot of skepticism. We should not aggress this. If you aggress this, there are a lot of unpredicted mothers. This issue will raise this, that. There are a lot of opposition. But now, how? Uh, obviously, this consensus is achieved. Huh? The results. What kind of results? You remember this, this is a very good example actually. What is our outlook about this baby hatch or you know, people, unwedded mothers or you know, people who are abandoned their babies? Now we have started accepting them. How this consensus came? Is it globalization? <laughs> huh? Is it raising levels of education? Or what is that? Or more and more you know, families are having you know, this history? Why? Why? How this consensus has been achieved? It's convincing part of it. Who convinced? Um, the, the insiders. Huh? The insiders. Insiders. Who are these insiders who were able to convince? The, the ministry. Um, the ministry. Okay. It's been convinced. It should be done. The women organizations have been convinced. It's a human rights lobby has convinced. Look, the consensus can be changed. It can be built over time. And that's where I think. And senses politics. I think the same goes for supplying needles for the drug or harm reduction. Initially, no one you know, buy this argument, you know. But you can build the consensus. I think so sure is a good idea. It is called consensus politics. You build in the consensus of the class. And you do this, basically you're doing consensus politics with the social policy or the policy that you want to achieve. You agree or not? This is one way of looking at it. This is what I mean. You can also achieve the breadth and the depth. Achieving the breadth may be easy. Initially, people just agree. You know, they they not agree inside the core art, but they say, okay, whatever Najib says, we will subscribe because it's good. It's, whatever he says, is good for the Malaysians. You know, he, he works for the country. Okay, they agree. But the depth. The baby policy, I think, still, still, you know, has to earn the depth of the consensus. People still not believing. You know, there are certain people who are you know, neither this side nor that side. They are not still subscribing. It is a human right, whatever. They still think that it creates more problems. For example, legalizing prostitution. For example, I'm sure there are people who still think that it is not good. So it's a human right. It legalized. For example, legalization of drugs. In Netherlands, it's the legalizing. You can use drugs. You know, you can also take uh, you know, help. You can buy and you know, all that. Why do they do that? Why we are not doing that in Malaysia? If you want to achieve that, you want to do that. What Nazir is doing the same thing. He's going everywhere trying to bring the consensus of people to his policies. So should we say that he's really you know trying to consensus politics with that? Policies that he's going to come up with? Of course, yes. This is the science. So we can see the breadth of the consensus is number of persons agreeing. All 20 million people have agreed. The depth of the consensus is number of related agreements. Okay, I subscribe to this baby hatch policy if the government brings this, 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 this. Then I subscribe to this. There should be other mechanisms should be in place, then I will, I will agree. So we can achieve both, actually. It's very deep, shallow, you know, the, the depth of the consensus and the narrow and the broad. So when you are trying to work with policies, I think the consensus politics or building consensus for a particular social policy, you remember this. Maybe first we will achieve only the breadth. And then you will achieve the, 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 uh, the, the depth. Or you only first achieve the depth, few you know, uh, people who really you know, agree with all these conditions and they can actually you know, go out and explain to others. Possible. So, can we really achieve consensus at pluralistic society like Malaysia? Because we are getting into other things now. What happens? This, Again, you know, a lot of things are written on that. What, have, what is it? What is a pluralistic society? Pluralism. Malaysia is a multi-ethnic pluralistic society, right? So, can we achieve consensus a group like this? I think this is one of the biggest issues every political party is talking about. 
So it is possible to achieve consensus, both the breadth and the depth in a pluralistic society. If not, we can't talk about this. Maybe we should create some foundational politics to achieve something. So this is also we need to look into this. Now I want to introduce, we have half an hour, consensus politics. This is what we are introducing, talking. Politics of consensus. You can go on this. People are using all this. I think you have got it already. We'll just move on. Now we will talk about confrontational politics. What is something called contentious politics? Uh, I think uh, I haven't uh, brought what is confrontational politics. Basically, confrontation. Different people confront, and maybe few groups win, and that becomes a social policy. Any any example? Huh? Confrontational politics. You confront, you argue, you negotiate. You know, group there are say environmental policy. What kind of policy is that? Do you think everyone will subscribe to that? Like industrialization is a must for the growth. So government is putting a lot of industries. But there is this anti-environment or whatever people or green people saying that no, industrialization is not good. There's a confrontation. Whoever wins, that becomes the policy. Any other example? Teaching maths and science in English. Teaching maths and science in English in schools. Yeah, there is arguments. Uh, these basics should be taught in mother tongue, or these, you know, basics should be taught in, a, in, a, in English, which is good for all the races or whatever. Again, whichever group wins, that becomes the, 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 the policy. Now, another interesting thing is contentious politics. What is this? Contentious politics is the use of disruptive techniques to make a political point or to change a government policy. Examples of such techniques are actions that disturb the normal activities of society such as demonstrations, general strikes, riots, terrorism, civil disobedience, revolution, insurrection, you can go on. Or uh, what is that? Uh, YouTube activism. It disrupts. Hmm? What do you think? Contentious politics is the one, disruptive techniques. You don't allow others to work, for example. Sitting before the you know, Prime Minister's office, not allowing him to go to work, or to his residence, not allowing him to sleep. I, I don't think you hear about these things in Malaysia. I've not heard at least in the last nine months. But you go to India, you go to uh, Nepal, you, you have a lot of examples of this. Tire burning, you, know, you just burn tires all the time on the roads. Roads, it disrupts the whole traffic. You burn the tire, the tires, unused tires, and just put them on the road. What happens? Then it is reality, not just exaggerating, turning by burning tires. All disruption. You disrupt the public life. You know, like you, you sleep on the train tracks. 100 people, 200 people, 300 people sleeping on the train tracks. The train cannot move. And don't strike, we call it. Infectious. Very effective, actually. So, as peaceful social movements to continue to exert powerful, Gandhi actually used contentious tools in, in, in freedom you know, struggle in India. A lot of demonstrations. But that was non violent, right? Contentious is not supposed to be non violent. That's what the idea is. You disrupt the life, you don't threat the life. You know? There's no threat to the life. We disrupt the government, you know, operations, the, the, the public life, but it again comes back. But you know, keep disrupting. But terrorism is, is, is terrorism cannot be uh, all the time. I mean, literal sense. Do you think what is terrorism is always is bad? You create terror. That's it. Not and then you go back. Terrorism is not like you know the bin. Uh, well, it's not like that. Not in that. At least that is what I understand. Terrorism is not that bad. I mean, some, uh, some, some, some people use this. You create a terror and then, you know, you go back. But terrorism, what we have understood is a lifelong or a continuous. It need not be. 
it need not to be that at least that's where I, 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 I understand this. So, so Gandhi's movement comes under conventions. To me that's what I understand. He's very peaceful, non-violent, but it disrupts the British function. You know, they could not really manage with him anymore. Because day to day it became an affair for them in that way. How then how about Deva's uh, also yes. I think he's uh, yeah, basically, I haven't read about this, uh, his, uh, his techniques. He was jailed for 27 years, right? Yeah. But when he was in jail, people outside are taking all these methods, I think. Yes. But he himself is not you know, involved, but he is very inspiration, writings and all that. To me, they're again, contentious. They contest with the government policy. They contest with the government, you know, uh, principles. They contest the way the government is working. So, basically, there are, you can see this. Gandhi's mix of ideology, Swaraj, or Satyagraha, Ahimsa, whatever. So basically, this is one way to understand, you know, what is contentious politics. In Malaysia, I see this. At least, Barisha, uh, one, two, three, whatever, it is coming, right? There is Barisha, one, two, three. Um, what is that? The rally that uh, they, they give numbers. Oh, Basse. Yeah, is coming, right? I think so. You think so? Yeah, I don't know if it will not ever come. I was really, this to me, are contentious politics. They're creating hype, they're creating, you know, some kind of thing. They want to disrupt something. But it's not a very, you know, confrontational, not very threatening, you know. So, basically, basically, if you want to for refugees, when you want to work with refugees, what kind of things you will do? For example, tomorrow we'll go for a referendum. 20, you know, out of 29 million, Malaysians, 15 million people say that, okay, we should give them, you know, work permits. We will go for that. You create that kind of consensus. And you will work. If it doesn't work, create, you know, some contentious, you know, methods. Not that confrontational. Maybe, you know, you will, you will blow up the immigration. I don't know, maybe it's recorded, but <laughs> I don't know what you will do. Or you will, uh, in, in Nepal, what they do, they, they kidnap uh, that particular, you know, uh, minister. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Sign, you know, the policy. What do you do? <laughs> you can prove that level. It's so that level. Like, this is happening all over the world. So that's confrontational. Very confrontational. You take arms. They took arms, you know. It's an armed struggle. So maybe more than that. So what I'm saying is, when we are talking about conflict or politics, it could be consensus, contentious. But you will have to be clear what you want to achieve and what is the best way to achieve that. And social policy is all, you know, political. You know? So always there is a conflict because there is always an insider, there is always an outsider, there is always a you know, supporter, there are always, you know, uh, anti-supporters, right? You agree or not? You think this helps to us? Then you go a little beyond and you understand the political economy and you know, the social policy. There's a lot of food aid. You know, why 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 the uh, US you know, sends a lot of food? Where in US itself there's a lot of people that don't have any food. US said food, you know, it goes oil, you know, the, the, the wheat, corn and all that goes. So what is that? Whereas in US itself there's a lot of you know migrants, refugees are not getting enough food. What is that? Political economy, politics? Global politics? Why, why Malaysia sent uh, to Palestine that 52, whatever? Huh? Solidarity? Huh? So political economy, you know? So all these things at the end of the day is not just what we think but beyond that. Political economy has been identified as a discipline that has premised upon the realization of economics a lot of money, aid, aid is all about economics and also politics, funding politics, you know, it cannot be studied separately, that is the production and distribution of wealth and power must be studied together. When you are studying economics, you are only studying the distribution and the production, but all the time there is this power attached to that which political science students will be studying. So when you are looking at the political economy, you are mixing three things. Production, distribution, and power. And political economy approach to social policy is looking at all these things again. No? 
it is argued that the core concerns of social policy are the best approach from a political economy perspective, conflict perspective, political economy perspective, globalization perspective. How many perspectives you have seen now in the whole 14 weeks? It's too many, that's the problem. But then that is where, that is what the, 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 the social policy can end. That's why it's not easy. You, you can spend the whole life. I'm sure you can spend the whole life and you know you are achieving uh, one by one, little by little. Whether you take political economy approach, contentious politics approach, consensus approach, whatever approach you take, at the end of the day you want to help these people. And how do you want to help? You have the science, the skills. And social policy is a very effective tool for social workers to do what they want to do. It's not because I'm teaching this course, but I have realized this in, in my 15 years of profession. After what are we doing? Yeah. We're actually touching the policy to help our clients. You are a micro social worker, macro social worker, community worker, doesn't matter. Basically, you are dealing with policies at the end of the day. Yes, Directly or indirectly. Sorry? We can take the whole life to do it. Yes. Of course, yes. Those books, you know. <laughs> the exam only in two hours. That's not a problem. So, basically, when we are saying power, and we are saying globalization, we are approaching social policy from a different point of view. Political economy point of view. That is one of the best ways to look at this. So when you are saying political economy, you are looking at the distribution, the economics, the power, the politics, everything. So it helps you to understand globalization and its impacts, both negative and positive. It helps us to increasingly uh, link the economic and social policies by governments, for example, when it comes to AIDS or uh, political aid or uh, donor aid or whatever. The emergence of new actors in the social welfare field, particularly for profit corporations, the new actors. Social entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurship for, uh, for profit, but again, you know, social innovations, media, there are so many new actors that are coming now, volunteers, international volunteers, so the emergence of new actors in the social welfare field, particularly for profit corporations, also makes social policy studies or social policy terrain much more interesting. So political economy approach to that, to social welfare or social policy, helps us to understand further. We can go on this. Broad consensus, not total agreement. Differences remain but very important, deeper paradigm shifts. I mean, basically we can go into these details. I will end with these slides. The ideas of econ economists and political philosophers, both when they are right, when they are wrong, and are, sorry, the ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful. Look at that. When they are right, also they are powerful. And they're wrong also they're part of the how? Huh? Yeah, good or bad, policy is a policy. So the, the ideas of economists, they may be wrong, and they're advising the ministers like you know, Prime Minister or Finance Minister, or political philosophers, they could be wrong and they could be right. In both times they're very powerful. Are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by a little else. Basically this says Keynes, you know, he says it is the world is being ruled by the political scientists and the economists. None other than them. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influences are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. Madmen in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their fringy from some academic scribbler of a few years back. Sooner or later, it is ideas, not vested interests, which are dangerous for good or evil. What is this Keynes saying? And why I have taken this very complex you know, uh, ending? for our political economy approach to social policy. I've taken this because there are these professional rivalries or backgrounds of influences, economics, political science, social work, 
political administration or public administration, we all have powers. We are all dealing with you know, policies. We bring our, our powers, we influence these policies the way we believe or the ideologies that we subscribe to. So the idea, that's where the ideas of economists and political philosophers, maybe political you know, representatives both when they are right and wrong are influential. So we really need to understand this. When a particular person in power, the, 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 the decisions that they make do touch the clients that we work with. So we need to understand people in power, the kind of ideologies they subscribe and understand our own ideologies and the things that we subscribe so that we can understand uh, the policies better and maybe we can understand policies better in a sense to work, to make them work for the people that we work with. So that is what I think to uh, the, 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 politi the politics of policy and the globalization. Any questions please? Thank you.